everyone. My name is Rachel Dry. I'm so happy to welcome you here to New York Times Op-Ed Live in Los Angeles. I'm thrilled you could join us. Um, I'm the editor of the Sunday Review section in the New York Times Opinion Department. And um, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, basically what that job is, is I get to think about people I like in the world and ask them their thoughts and then put it in a newspaper or sometimes bring them here to assemble, um, I think basically like a feminist Avengers squad, which is what <laughs> we're doing here tonight. Um, I would say like most of my favorite people who I've gotten to work with will be joining us here on stage. But I did want to share one story um, about someone I, th I think about around this time of year, someone I got to meet through my job. Um, and that person is Kathy Geiswait, who wrote the cartoon st uh, strip Kathy. Oh, good, okay. There is one yes. You may think like, you want to appeal to us and make us think you're hip and cool. Why are you using a reference from a syndicated comic strip that was in print newspapers that stopped being created in 2010? And the answer is because it was very meaningful to me. Um, as a child, that's like what I read first in the paper, like way before the Honey Nut Cheerios word search. Like I went right to Kathy, and why not? She was amazing. She had a catchphrase, ack. She had a dog, I like dogs. She got a guy named Irving, a Jewish girl's dream. <laughs> and she like had all these fun challenges to overcome, like you know, retaining her autonomy and her ambition while also seeking out a rewarding romantic relationship while also being alive in the world in a body society told her to hate. Like what else would you want to read before fourth grade? But that, that was just like when um, I thought it was just a cool story and not um, a prophecy. So, but so, so Kathy was very meaningful to me and, and she wrote a piece for us and then she was in New York and, and I got to meet her and we had this um, very interesting conversation. I was asking her if, if, if she thought, you know, if she created Kathy today, would the character face the same challenges? And we talked about it for a bit. And then I have to believe it just came to her mind. It wasn't related to that question. She thoughtfully asked me, well, how is your dating life? <laughs> just like totally unrelated to a 21st century Kathy. And I said, oh, Kathy, it's like not so great. And she said, I know it's hard out there, isn't it? And I was like, yeah, Kathy, it's almost as if someone wrote a comic strip for multiple decades where a single woman looking for love was the punchline. Um, but that was actually Valentine's Day uh, two years ago, I think. And she um, drew me a Valentine f from Kathy. And it, yeah, and I think about her at this time of year because um, you know, that, that was maybe the only Valentine I got that year from Kathy. And I was like, Kathy still got it. Um, but it also... It filled me with a great deal of hope. Um, and and I, it's good to be hopeful about finding love or whatever you're searching for at this moment. I was thinking um, recently about how much different I thought, you know, being alive in this moment, you know, looking for love might be. Um, I was thinking about this because not that long ago I found a diary that I kept in seventh grade. And I, I read it. <laughs> um, the whole thing was written as if it was going to be useful for historians in the future. <laughs> And, and I know that because I wrote, should anyone be reading this in the future? <laughs> and I was so confident that dating adult men was gonna be so much easier than dating junior high boys. <laughs> I, I was wrong about some other things too. Um, I was super excited about email. I thought having an email address would be great. I would say now it's like the number one problem in my life. I'm, um, I don't really like New Year's resolutions, but I, I did try, I'm trying to like be better at email, like using fewer exclamation points or listening to that horrible advice people give women sometimes to be more direct. So instead of saying like, oh wow, what an outside the box take. That wasn't what I was thinking, but we certainly could explore that option. I just want to say no. <laughs> it, it means exactly the same thing. <laughs> One is much more efficient. But that's, it's like scary to do that. Scary to, you know, put yourself out there and say what you really think. So, so for now, the, the only thing I've actually managed to do is um, I'm just not hoping anyone's well. I'm just not doing it. <laughs> You can wonder. You can wonder what I'm hoping. 
Um, well, it's not email, so I'll break my rule. I do certainly hope you are all well, and I hope you're excited for what uh, we're going to share with you tonight. I'm thrilled to introduce um, the first performer. She's a contributing writer for the New York Times. She is the author of the book Shrill, which will be a television show on Hulu next month. Um, please join me in welcoming the one, the only, Lindy West. You rejected my hug. Hi. Okay. It's always like, like a real tightrope to put the water on the slope, but it's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. Oh, I I can't see any of you, um, but I just have faith that you're here, and I um, I think I appreciate it if. It's real. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do a humorous PowerPoint, <laughs> just what you've all been hankering for all day. Okay, it's about... Okay, let's, do you think this laser works? Ooh, <laughs> it does, okay. Has like, uh, never mind, you can't see it. The, the logo, the like little icon for the laser looks like a weed leaf. <laughs> if you're into that. Um, you seem pretty cool, so. Um, okay, so. <laughs> sorry. Okay, here we go. So a few months ago, my husband was at a bar in Chicago. And someone had told him to check out this bar because it was like a cool dive bar run by queer people of color. And the night he was there, there was a DJ and people were dancing and partying and like it was really fun. And um, he was sitting at the bar having a drink. And after a while, a, a white guy came and sat down next to him. White guy, like late 40s, maybe 50s, um, like super standard, random white guy. Polo shirt, mustache. Um, and I just want to say right up front that I realized during the making of this humorous PowerPoint that um, it's illegal to make a humorous PowerPoint using other people's copyrighted images. Um, <laughs> so I had to improvise a little bit and I hope that um, you can just roll with me on this. Um, so the guy... Uh, <laughs> um, so... What? So, the guy, um, <laughs> okay, hold on. So, okay, I made this. <laughs> this is my real husband, and this is an, an actor that I found, I hired to play um, the role of the white guy. Um, and th so the guy's name was Larry, or like Barry, or whatever. Um, I'm gonna call him Larry Barry for the purposes of this story. And he strikes up a conversation with my husband and he asks him if he's having fun. And my husband is like, yeah, yeah man, this is a cool bar. Uh, people are dancing, it's great. And the guy gets a real sad look on his face and he goes, um, yeah, this is one of my favorite songs. I wish I was dancing right now. I know. And so my husband said, well, buddy, Larry Berry, why don't you go dance? And Larry Berry says, I'm not allowed to dance. Can you believe it? So my husband was confused, understandably. There did not seem to be any restrictions on who was or was not allowed to dance. And so he said, Larry Berry, why are you not allowed to dance? And then Larry Berry told his tale. <laughs> okay, let's just, let's just get real. This is me, okay. Um, yeah, I know, I'm a master, I'm a chameleon. Um, I'm like, uh, who's the guy that always plays all the other guys? I'm like Andy Circus. whatever, I don't know. Okay. Um, my mom, I did this humorous PowerPoint once in Seattle 
And then afterwards, my mom was like, who was, who was that guy? <laughs> First of all, it was obviously me with a, a, a mustache, a Sharpie mustache taped to my face. And second of all, I look exactly like dad. Like, why do you not? <laughs> this just is my dad. Okay, anyway. Um, okay, so I forget if, what's, if I'm on the right slide. But um, Larry Berry told his tale, and he said, well, two nights ago I came to this bar because it's the closest bar to my house. And I come here all the time. And they were having a dance night, and I love to dance. And so I went out on the dance floor, and there were some people out there dancing, and so I just started dancing with this girl, and then she said, I don't really want to dance with you, and then her friend got all weird about it. So now I guess I'm not allowed to dance. Okay, can you believe that? He's not allowed to dance. This is what it's come to. This is what the PC police have done to us. Well, sorry if I don't want to live in a world where straight white men in their 40s with mustaches can't go to the queer POC dance night and non-consensually grind on lesbians they don't know without their friends getting all weird about it. So my husband said, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure if you just go out there and dance and you don't touch anyone, you'll be fine. And Larry Berry thought, hmm, don't touch anyone. What's that? <laughs> but he decided to go for it, and as he got up from the bar, he looked at my husband, and he said, man to man, if something goes wrong, will you back me up? <laughs> and my husband said, if something goes wrong, you will look over here, and you will find that this chair is empty, <laughs> and you will never see me again, because I don't know you. Okay, so this modern fable, The Ballad of Larry Berry, um, tells us quite a bit about our current moment in history. Um, it seems that a lot of men are confused, um, mistaking being asked not to violate other people's sexual boundaries with being forbidden to participate in basic human activities, such as <laughs> dancing, um, going to work, and telling jokes. So, one thing that you hear a lot when a man, particularly a man we all like, gets accused of something awful, is that the accusations aren't real, but are in fact part of a witch hunt. So the term witch hunt, um, so many witch hunts. Also, I would like to say that we've been doing this for so long that this one is very old. <laughs> like, we've just, this, this has just been our thing. Um, I mean, Okay, so uh, <laughs> the term witch hunt is most commonly used to refer to the witch trials of early modern Europe and colonial America, during which an estimated 40 to 60,000 people were brutally tortured by being briefly ostracized at work and having a lot of people yell at them. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I read it, sorry, I read it wrong. Uh, they were hanged beheaded or burned at the stake, but still very, very similar to the Me Too witch hunts. Um, I'm gonna demonstrate how. So, um, as you can see, this is a painting or something, I don't know, <laughs> uh, of a colonial witch hunt. Um, and for those of you who aren't art historians, like, like me, um, I've annotated it to show you um, just how similar modern day witch hunts are. Okay, so it's kind of hard to read because I'm not good at graphic design, but um, so here we have um, men who did nothing wrong and they're being burned alive by, um, these are feminists, as you can see, obviously. Um, <laughs> and, the, uh, and then this, uh, this man who did nothing wrong in the back is being tormented by a harpy who represents uh, how Sharon's butt looked in those pants. <laughs> because come on, Sharon. Shouldn't have worn those pants if you didn't want a man to do nothing wrong to you. Um, and then in the background, um, and this is classic iconography, uh, we have a feminist uh, murdering due process with a sword, <laughs> while the court of public opinion, AKA social media, does nothing about it. They love it. And then um, over here, free speech is dying on the ground 
No one cares. And then in this tower, um, we have two guys from Reddit heroically trying to save the legacy of Brett Ratner, which is on fire. <laughs> and that's what a witch hunt is. Okay, I think we all learned. Did you know you were going to come here and learn? So I'm, I got to say, I'm sympathetic to people who feel like they're being left behind in this new world. <sighs> Um, you know, like, <laughs> sorry, um, you know, I understand that it's scary to suddenly face consequences for things that used to be socially acceptable, and I hear a lot of hand-wringing from men about how they're going to adapt, you know, um, and some of it's very generous, like very, um, <laughs> very philanthropic, like won't, I've had men say this to me, won't it affect women's upward mobility if men are afraid to work with them? because they just can't stop sexually harassing. <laughs> Great cue. Um, how are people supposed to date and procreate in this minefield? What if I get fired over a simple misunderstanding? Don't worry, I got you. I've created a few tutorials to help ease the transition in this difficult time. Okay, tutorial number one. How to interact with your female coworkers without getting fired for sexually harassing them. Useful, right? Hella useful, okay. Like, feel free to take notes. You're well, like, this is go going to come in handy, um, I guess, <laughs> I guess, uh, no one, never mind, I, okay, let's just see, I, <sighs> okay. <laughs> Feel free to take a picture of the screen and laminate it and hand it out to your <laughs> male coworkers. Um, okay, tip number one, don't talk about genitals. <laughs> hey, you're at fucking work. Like, unless you're, like, a gynecologist <laughs> or, uh, 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 I can't think of another one. <laughs> like, okay. Um, okay, how about treat them like you treat your male coworkers when you're not talking to your male coworkers about genitals, which I understand you probably do, but see number one. Okay. Um, tip number three is, come on, you already know how to do this. Like, pretend you're at your fucking niece's baby shower. You know what I mean? Pretend you're giving your sister a back rub. Like, is it, are you able to not have a boner? Like, just, it's fine. <laughs> Pretend you're being arrested. Like, there are all kinds of times when you don't engage your genitals. <laughs> I know you know how to do this. Okay, uh, tip number four. How about just do work when you're at work? <laughs> Like, okay. Uh, tip number five, come on. <laughs> Fucking, what the fuck, man? Okay. Tutorial number two. How to date. This one's really tricky. Okay, step one. Do you want to get coffee sometime? That's all you got to say. Do you want to get coffee sometime? If they say no, go away. <laughs> Interaction over. <laughs> so easy. Step three, don't commit sexual assault. <laughs> I can't believe no one wrote this book before. I mean, like, I'm so sorry that we didn't tell you these rules. It's like, that is on us, that's our bad. <sighs> okay, remember, this one's really hard for people. Anyone's allowed to dump you at any time. Like, just because someone went on a date with you or, like, fucking, like, boned you for five years, they get to just go away because they have free will. Um, okay. Uh, they're not like your fucking ferret that you can keep on a harness. Okay. <laughs> Step five, get over it. Go, move on with your life. Go do other stuff. You get one life. Just go. Okay. <laughs> That's it. That one's not even a joke. Like, just, okay. Do you want to get coffee sometime? No, go away, don't commit sexual assault, get like, al allow yourself to be dumped, get over it. <sighs> okay, tutorial number three, misunderstandings. <laughs> I mean, okay, so misunderstandings are real. Like, let's not get it twisted. Um, but I gotta say that I feel like some men, not all men, have like really misappropriated the word misunderstanding. You know, like, if you do something bad to someone, 
uh, and then they complain about it, and then you tell them that it was all a big misunderstanding. <laughs> That's just you um, being um, a hell person. So, <laughs> it seems like some people are confused about what constitutes a misunderstanding and what constitutes you being a demon. So, um, here are some examples of real misunderstandings. A misunderstanding is if, you know, say you're in an office setting and you say, oh hey, I have that toner you've been looking for. The printer's not, not working, okay? But they thought you said, hey, I have that boner you've been looking for. That would be a true, classic misunderstanding. Okay, um, another example, if you say, um, oh, I, I like your office chair, you know, maybe like, you know, like Jessica's to tooting around on a, on a brand new sparkly um, wheelie chair. I like, your, I like your office chair. But she thought you said, I like your orifice hair. <laughs> that would be a real misunderstanding. <laughs> Examples of not misunderstandings. Um, when you want to touch Jennifer's butt, so you just do it. <laughs> that doesn't count. When your phone number is blocked, um, so you get a new phone number. <laughs> Not a misunderstanding. Um, when you drink a thousand beers at a house party and force a terrified 15-year-old girl into a bedroom and push her down on a bed and press your body on top of her so she can't move and try to rip her clothes off, and when she tries to scream for help, you clamp your hand over her mouth so tightly she thinks you might accidentally suffocate her and the whole time you're just laughing and laughing with your friend as though this girl is just a thing for you to use because you own the world. Not a misunderstanding. Also, not a disqualification for being on the Supreme Court. Like, it's like, do you even remember what that's referring to? Because so much has happened since that. Like, I, that's like an old, like a dead reference now. Okay. Um, so I want to return to my opening anecdote about Larry Berry, who wasn't allowed to dance. For the purposes of a cleaner narrative flow, I considered changing the story and just saying that it was me who had the encounter with Larry Berry at the bar instead of relaying the story secondhand through my husband because um, it would just have been better storytelling. But I realized that the story doesn't work with me sitting at the bar because um, he would never say that to me. The frustration that Larry Berry expressed to my husband at not being allowed to dance anymore because bitches are too sensitive was contingent on the assumption that of a shared understanding a collective lamentation between men. He was not trying to complain to my husband, he was trying to commiserate with him about the loss of power and freedom, of no longer being the one who makes the rules, of no longer having the benefit of the doubt in every interaction. Um, this whole presidency is a backlash to progress that we fought for. It's a panicked response to something as simple as marginalized people telling the truth about what's happened to them. Um, I don't know what the fuck's gonna happen. <laughs> this part's not funny anymore. Um, sorry. Uh, I don't know what the fuck's gonna happen, but I know that the reason that this is so fucked up is because Larry Berry is fucking terrified, and we did that. We fucking did that. And to some extent, they still control our futures, but they're shitting their pants, and they should be, and that's the end of my talk. <laughs> I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Lindy West. I know it, it wasn't like entirely clear what op-ed live was. I'm glad you bought tickets anyway. It was HR training. Like, <laughs> you can tell your boss. It was the most relevant HR training you'll get this year. Um, <laughs> Our next performer is a hilarious comedian. He's the author of the book, My Life as a Goddess. He's the host of Talk Show, The Game Show. He's a New York Times contributor. And I would like to welcome right now, the, the brilliant Guy Branham. Hello. My name is Guy. Uh, I, I met Rachel a couple of years ago when I had to live in New York for a job. 
Who, who here knows what they say about New York? This is a live show. You're here right now. This is not the internet unless you're watching this on the internet. I am attempting to engage with you. Greatest city in the world. Not really something you see on a bumper sticker that's cute though. Also, you live in Los Angeles. Look at the weather. It's not the greatest city in the world there. Shh. I'll pander later. Um, what do they say about New York? City that never sleeps is correct. Not what I was looking for, but you will get credit. Shh. That's enough. New York. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. They do not say that about Los Angeles. Because you can make it here. Shit is fine in Los Angeles. And I know, you're probably saying, but guy, but guy, I get sad sometimes. I moved here seven years ago to be an actor. I'm still not famous. To which I would reply, yeah, go cry in your pool. And sure, it may just be a pool in the middle of your apartment building in Toluca Lake. It is still functional in February. Oh, oh, do you not have a recording contract yet? Go have sex with a human being who would be the hottest person in any town in Nebraska. Because life is hard everywhere. This is just the place that it is least hard on the planet. And we don't come up with cute little sayings about it because there are already too many people here. Avocados are expensive enough. Who, who here was born in California? I myself was born in California. I was born on an almond farm uh, about an hour north of Sacramento. People say that we, we shouldn't grow almonds here in California because they take up too much water and they are contributing to the drought. Who here was not born in California? I don't think we have a drought because there are almonds in California. I think we have a drought because you people are in California. Drinking our water, swimming in our pools, shitting in our clean drinking water. In the entirety of the United States, there is one place where you can grow almonds. Meanwhile, you can grow white guys in hoodies anywhere. You may have noticed that I am unusually large for a homosexual. I am not certain why this is the case. My current working theory is that once my mother realized I was going to be gay, she figured she might as well raise the largest one in the county. If she's not getting grandchildren out of the deal, at least she could get a blue ribbon. <laughs> Some of you are judging me. You're saying, but guy, but guy, if you're that worried about your size, why not do something about it? Why not lose the weight? Isn't being attractive more important than any pleasure food could potentially bring you? <laughs> the trouble, ladies and gentlemen, is that I don't know if love really exists but I'm certain that really good pastrami does. <laughs> Plus, a sandwich won't give me gonorrhea. Uh, who, here, who here met their significant other on the internet? Like through apps or whatever. Most of you are lying. Um, <laughs> I, like every, everyone here is on apps. If you are looking for someone, you are using the power of technology, accept it. Like the thing is, is I don't like using apps for dating. I need using apps for dating. I'm not for everyone. I am a unique boutique product. 
I am the sexual equivalent of a left-handed oyster shucking glove. Not everybody needs this, but those who do will know how to use it. Years ago, like right after I came out of the closet, there was like a self-help book for gay guys. It was called Finding the Boyfriend Within. And the premise was that you should try to be the kind of guy that you want to date. I think I can do better than me. <laughs> like, I'm smart, I'm funny, I'm on TV a lot. Why would I want to date some fat, bald, sweaty guy who's constantly talking about Canadian history? All right, I'll get political for a moment. <laughs> um, did you guys know in Canada, they uh, spend $300 billion every year to give everyone health care? And in this country, we spend around $800 billion every year on defense. And some people think we should take that money we spend on defense and give everyone health care. I disagree. I think we should take that money we spend on defense and then take Canada's health care. <laughs> I mean, we've declared like five wars in the past 20 years over oil. Can't we just go into Toronto one weekend and just get dentists for everybody? <sighs> so I feel like Oh, I have another surprisingly conservative opinion. Are you guys ready for it? Because I, this is not a liberal echo chamber, you guys, okay? <laughs> because the, here's something that I, I, I actually like, have a strong opinion about. Do you guys know the couple, the gay couple in Colorado who went to a baker and tried to buy a wedding cake and the baker said that they would not bake a wedding cake for a gay, for a gay wedding and then they took the baker to the Supreme Court? I disagree with that. I don't think they should have done that. I think if you're a gay couple in America and you can't find a reality cooking competition show to cater your wedding, that's your problem. Don't, don't go to the Supreme Court, go to Padma. Okay. I feel like we've come to a point in the show where you've learned a little bit about me, I've learned a little bit about you guys, and you guys are probably starting to make some judgments about me and who I am. Like, you're probably thinking to yourselves, that is a man who will never be married to New England Patriots tight end Rob Gronkowski. <laughs> and I get it. I understand why you would think that. A, New England Patriots tight end Rob Gronkowski is not, to our knowledge, a homosexual. B, if New England Patriots tight end Rob Gronkowski is indeed a homosexual, he can do better than this. And C, neither New England Patriots tight end Rob Gronkowski nor I appear to have the relationship skills necessary to make a marriage work. I get why you would think that. It is reasonable to think that. It is probable to think that. But I ask you, if I had come to you 10 years ago and said, hey, in the not too distant future, a mid-rated NBC reality show host will be the leader of the free world, what would you have said? Would that have seemed reasonable? If I came to you 20 years ago and said, hey, you know that decathlete from the Wheaties box? She's a woman, and her name is Caitlin. What would you have said? Would that have seemed probable? If I came to you 30 years ago and said, I have a device in my pocket the size of a deck of cards that contains all of the works of Demi Lovato, what would you have said? Probably who is Demi Lovato. But my point stands that we live in a world of infinite possibilities. And we go through our lives just working with what's reasonable and what's probable. And I ask you, 
If you live in a world where anything can happen, why not reserve some small part of your heart, not for those things that are reasonable or probable, but for those things you want most? Because, ladies and gentlemen, in this life, there's only one thing you can know with certainty. You will not be invited to my wedding to New England Patriots tight end Rob Gronkowski. <laughs> Thank you very much and good evening. I'm Guy Branham. <laughs> Rachel, I did a tight 10. Where are you? Um, thank you. Hi, Branham. Um, well, until someone produces Guy and the Gronk, which will then become the world's favorite love story <laughs> that you could see on, on screens, big or small, um, my current favorite is one we're going to show you a little taste of right now, and that, excuse me, and that we'll then um, be talking with the co-writer of. So please enjoy a small taste of the big sick. <clears throat> okay, the year is 1969. MGM has had a string of failures, so it turns to its most bankable star, Vincent Price. Is this your compatibility test? Like the way some people are with Vonnegut or Big Lebowski? No! Just watch the movie and take it seriously, because it's very it. serious. I love it when men test me on my taste. I just want to share this movie with you, so how I don't many, know why you're reading into... How many women have you showed this movie to? Zero. How many women have you showed a B horror movie to on like a third date? This is not a B horror movie. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Hi, <laughs> sorry. Um, so that was um, a scene from the love story of uh, Camille Nanjiani and Emily Gordon, and please remain in welcoming to the stage now, Emily Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> is this my couch? This is your couch. Okay. This Hello, is your couch. Hi. Hello, Los Angeles. Hi. So um, thank you so much for joining us. This is basically um, questions I thought would be like a little bit too creepy to email Emily after I watched the movie four times. And I was like, this is a much more natural setting, I think. <laughs> Yeah, with all of our closest friends. Right. Here. My favorite couches are here. They're Should I couches. sit here? Because we're the only ones using these. I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, we're just going to have a chat. Move anywhere. So, what I want to know is um, like, people say weird things all the time, even if you didn't write about your love story that became a very successful Oscar nominated movie. <laughs> um, I want to know like, what are some of the sort of most overshare moments of people's own love stories you've heard oh, now yeah. that your life and love is, is on screen? I think that is something that I had not really bargained for uh, so much, and I got very comfortable with them very quickly. Um, for the most part, we get a lot of, <laughs> we'll get couples that come up to us that are uh, of two different ethnicities, and they come up to us and go, eh, eh, eh? And we're like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and a lot of people want to ask us uh, about, like, what do you do when your parents don't approve of the person you're in love with? Um, and I don't really have any good answer. I don't recommend the route that we took. Uh, just, just to let you guys know, no comas. I don't think that that is a great route uh, to take to get someone to accept kind of the person that you love. But I do feel like it's, it's such an interesting thing because it's something you don't really see in rom-coms a lot of... When you're dating someone, you really are dating their entire family, and you kind of are dating everyone, all of the baggage that they kind of come with, and that's done in a cutesy way in movies. Like, yeah, I have to... romantic baggage. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good. Like, you have to win over the mom by baking a perfect pie or whatever. Yeah. But it's a, it's a real thing, and it's, uh, it's something that people say to us all the time. And then the other thing people do, I'll just be walking by, and I literally will hear people go, hey, I was in a coma, too! And you're like... <laughs> Now I have to stop, and, and I get it. That's, a tough, that's not just a head Cool, bro. You can't. Thanks for watching. I can't do that. I have to then, so I've had many very intense conversations with complete strangers on the street. Literally, people walk up and be like, let's take a look at this, and uh, showing me their scars. And it's, it's kind of lovely, because I didn't talk about being sick for a long time, yeah. and I, it's nice, bless you. Speaking of, uh, <laughs> I also sneeze sometimes. Yeah, like we're all connected. We're all together. Yeah. So it's nice to have like, uh, it's nice to kind of, for me to feel like a person that people can unburden themselves to. Yeah. That feels good. That's 
that's really why you're here tonight, Emily. I have some, no, <laughs> some burdens today. Um, I was thinking a little bit about the story. So for, I hope everyone's seen the movie, but Emily made brief reference to the coma um, in the movie and in life. Uh, she, they met, um, were getting along, then had, there was a medical crisis involving a coma. And then me. Yes. Yeah. A coma patient. <laughs> yeah. Then the happy ending follows. So um, it's you know just like the traditional meet cute really, <laughs> where there's like a medical crisis in the middle. But I was thinking about this like um, you know the way people people love a meet cute story, but the way we're you know getting to know each other these days, it's like not always. You, you don't know, get the meet cute. You don't get the meet cute. Do you think we'll like move beyond it? Like people will stop asking how did you meet? Not I think it's can. always going to be, I mean, it's on, it's on the same level as, like, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to, like, it's on the same level of, like, questions people ask. But I do think there is a weird magic to it. Because even if you meet online, at some point you have a first meeting with someone. And there is, like, a magic. Like, that's your origin story. If we were superheroes, like, that would be your little origin story. And so I think, I hope it never goes out of style. Because I think... But before I did this, I was a couples and family therapist, and the first thing you do with a couple is you ask them to tell you the story of how they met, because even a couple that will be fighting miserably, hating each other, will always stop and kind of tell you, like, oh, well, actually. And suddenly it kind of shifts, because it takes you back to this, like, magical time of, like, oh, my God, anything could happen. The possibilities, that little giddy feeling you get, so I don't think, I hope it never goes out of style. What I think we need to maybe focus on more is like the relationship. <laughs> and whether, because it's like the people who like spend all their money and time focusing on a wedding and not thinking about the marriage itself. Uh, yeah, maybe focus on the relationship too, as well as the meet cute. But even if you don't have a good meet cute, as long as it's yours. As long as yeah, it's, it's yours. Yeah, it's good, yeah. Um, I wondered, I think for many of us, um, like how we think about love and what we're looking for can be shaped by the, the movies we see and the pop culture we watch. I'm wondering like um, for people who saw the movie or for like say an impressionable 11 year old whose parents didn't really set the Amazon parental controls and <laughs> who, ha who happened to watch your movie, like what do you hope their story of love that they carry forward is? From well, I really hate rom-coms. <laughs> uh, do, do people here like them or do you, do, who, who hates rom-coms? Who loves them? Okay, sorry. I really hated them, and I, I know it's kind of my fault, but like when I was watching them as a kid, I took them as a playbook for how I was supposed to be in a relationship. And what I learned from them is that I am supposed to be easy and that a guy gets to be complicated. Mm -hmm. The guy gets to have this like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I don't know how I'm gonna handle. I love her, but also I got this restaurant I gotta run, and what am I gonna do? And like, a classic, classic, classic. And whereas my job, me looking at it as a young woman, was like, I'll wait for him to get uncomplicated enough to love me, and then we'll be together forever. And that, what I took from that is that my job is to be easy to be around. Not easy in the slutty sense, although I absolutely, that was an issue. But to be like, <laughs> that helped. To be like easy to be around and to be uncomplicated. And so I worked really, really hard to be uncomplicated, and it wasn't working, and I kept failing, because we're all complicated, it turns out. And I think that's something, there's a, Halle, Halle Berry in Boomerang has the one really famous line of like, love should have brought your ass home last night, but the line, <laughs> say what? The line before, the, big boomerang thing. Yeah, yeah, it's great, boomerang. the line before that always struck me more, which was, I'm sick and tired of men acting like love is a disease that you catch. And that was kind of something that always struck me is that often in movies, love is seen as this thing you have to endure. Like it's awful and it's miserable, but you gotta do it because that's what you do, right? You fall in love and it's like never fun, never good. And then the movie ends when they're like smiling at each other and you hope it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, it really bummed me out. So I, I hope that people watching our movie, there were two moments in our movie uh, that people really warned us, told us we needed to change. Mm. One was, uh, so Camille and Emily get together, break up, she goes into a coma, 
he kind of falls in love with her, just recapping if anyone hasn't seen it. He falls in love with her while she's in the coma, essentially, and like realizes what she is. She wakes up, he's like, let's do this, and she's like, Ugh. And then eventually they kind of do get together. We kept getting notes that when he comes and makes this big play for her, I love you, look at all this stuff I did for you, I was there for you, she should fall into his arms. While I was in the coma, this is what I was dreaming about. <laughs> you couldn't register brain activity, yeah. but I was thinking of you. Yeah, yeah. And, and this idea that, like, <laughs> that's a brain activity. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, I don't know how comas work. I'm really sorry. <laughs> it's, um, it's not a medical advice show. <laughs> That is very funny. Uh, but people kept saying to us, well, like, when he makes the big play, she should, like, fall for it. She should get back together with him. But she ha isn't in the same spot he's in. And she's kind of dealing with some shit right now. Like, let her get over this medical thing, and then maybe they can talk about it. Right. The other thing they wanted us to change was that they desperately wanted Holly Hunter, who plays Emily's mother, to at some point, like, turn to, to, turn to Emily and be like, go get him. <laughs> Get, he's good, go get him. Mm. And we kept being like, yeah, yeah, thank you. Oh, I can do a great Holly Hunter. I will never do it in front of her. <laughs> it's kind of like her. I think she's here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's the best. Uh, she is one third my size. Um, but she, we never wanted to have the sense of like, why on earth would a mom who just had her daughter go through this life-threatening illness give a shit who her daughter is dating? Mm. And it, to me, these are like tropes from rom-coms that I really, really wanted us to kind of mess with a little bit because I got tired of seeing them and not feeling like I was good enough. I also, because I'm a nerdy girl, was frequently subjected to men showing me their world of pop culture. Mm. Like I didn't know, ooh, The Watchmen, really? Oh, great. <laughs> the number of men who have tried to get me to read The Watchmen or play bass, I could write a book. Uh, <laughs> It's such a thing, because every man like wants to, sh they feel like it's, it's them, and I get it, it's them introducing you to who they are. Don't they want you to watch them play bass, or just in case? I mean, that, yeah. no, they want me to play bass in their band, oh, okay. so then I can also listen, be with them when they're in a band. I've dated some real winners. Um, so we, we, <laughs> what's that we, you briefly mentioned and did like a tantalizing taste of a Holly Hunter um, impression. <laughs> So it is fun. You had the, I mean, you had the unique experience of getting to cast people in your real life. Um, it was funny, like when you were promoting the movie and then talking about it, because this is an Oscar-nominated screenwriter on stage with us. Um, <laughs> and I realized in asking this question, it makes it very clear, like how many interviews of you I watched on YouTube, which is just like a totally normal thing to admit <laughs> in this setting. Um, but people kept asking you, like, was it hard to cast yourself? Like, um, to cast an actor to be like, intimate with your husband, which I'm not gonna ask you that question because you answered it, I don't know, probably 400 times. Spoiler alert, no. <laughs> um, but you, then you got to cast like Ray Romano as your dad and Hollywood as your mom. So um, I wonder like, if you had to cast a different part of your life, like, um, like your first kiss. Like who is, who is the actor, we might not all, who like, well, embodies you at what age, age? The actor that embodies me? Oh, I don't even want to get into that. Okay, the, that could the, be. The, the, the person in question, the gentleman okay. in question. If you had to cast your, your love interest from your first okay, kiss. Okay, so my first kiss, I was 13. I was in line at a theme park in North Carolina mm. for a roller coaster. Romantic. Uh, and a guy named Jason, who was in a hip-hop group. I was mm. 13, he was 14. He was in a hip-hop group, and he kept telling me they'd open for Guns N' Roses. Swear <laughs> to God. And I... That was like my first sense of like, I know he's lying, but I'm just gonna play along. <laughs> so I was like, oh cool, what's Axel like? I totally, uh, he like leaned in and, and made out with me and I was very, very consensual, I was very into it, it was great. I think if I were to cast him, I was always going for the guys that were like midway between, you got like a, a Darius from Atlanta, mm. like Keith Stanfield, uh, and like a Christian Slater and Heathers. Mm. <laughs> Like the guys who are like very complicated and kind of moody and saying like real random shit all the time. And then you look up and it's, they moved into your house three weeks ago. <laughs> and like, you're like, what? And they're like explaining physics to you while like eating cereal and they have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> I kind that was of, a real twist at the end, Emily, <laughs> that they didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah, I know. Wasn't it yeah. crazy? Yeah. yeah. I, those are, yeah, that would be Jason, who I'm sure is doing great. I think we're Facebook friends. Yeah. yeah. 
I hope Jason's doing great. I hope you are all doing great. <laughs> we're going to wrap this part of the conversation, but you'll see Emily in a little bit later when we're all joining you um, here. But I will say, uh, see you later. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Thank well, you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs> Um, so Emily had, uh, has a lot of wise things to tell us um, in general, and you'll hear from her later, but for now I want to um, introduce to you uh, a live version of an advice column that we run um, in the Times Opinion section. It's the person I would most want to put like any query at all to, um, and tonight we're going to focus on love in a broad sense. Um, so please join me in welcoming to the stage Roxanne Gay. I'll see you a little bit. <laughs> wow. This is a pretty space. I mean, looks matter. Um, they do. So I'm really good at advice. <laughs> that, that's it. So, um, you know, it's funny because I was on Twitter maybe a year and a half ago and I was just bullshitting the way I do on Twitter. And I said, oh, I want an advice column. I mean, like, I also want a pony. And Rachel, who is my editor, emailed me and was like, I'll give you an advice column. <laughs> and I was like, do I have to give you a kidney or what? And she said, no, just a pancreas. So I miss my pancreas, but I also get to give out advice, which is my favorite thing to do because I'm the last person you should go to for any sort of advice. Uh, no, I'm not good at it. I'm, I'm a shit show. So I'm just going to give you a trash person's advice. <laughs> like, so, but these are real liars. <laughs> um, I'm not going to tell you their names, but how, here's the first question. How does one cope with being unlovable and unlikely to ever find love? I'm almost 30. <laughs> Have never had a relationship except for the very long distance one I'm currently in. And everywhere I look, people I used to know are married or engaged. I know not everyone finds someone. I don't know how to stop being so regretful about how my life has turned out and accept that I may never find someone who would want to be with me. I feel sad, lonely, and obsessed. Please help. Oh. You know, when I read this letter, I felt a lot of kinship with this letter writer because who among us has not been there and just thought no one's ever going to love me again? And I wish I could say you're going to find your one true love, but our one true love is never promised to us. That said, I mean, girl, you're only 29. <laughs> just to, like, simmer down. <laughs> it's funny. The other day I was in Toronto doing an event with the Toronto Film Festival. I was screening Pretty Woman because they asked me what movie I wanted to screen, and I think they thought I was going to say, like, a, a, an arty film. <laughs> and so to fuck with them, I was like, oh, Pretty Woman. <laughs> And then they let me. <laughs> and before Pretty Woman, I met with a group of young writers from the Toronto area. And this girl said, you know, I feel like my career has passed me by. I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to be anything. And I said, how old are you? <laughs> and she said she was 21. <laughs> and so I told her to get the fuck out. <laughs> you know, the thing is, life is long. You're almost 30, but your life is really just beginning. It's not actually going to get good until you turn 40. So you only have to be unhappy for another 10 years. <laughs> I actually didn't really find anything even remotely resembling real love, like sustainable, non-trash love, until I was in my 40s. And you're going to find someone out there who wants you exactly as you are. You're not going to have to contort yourselves. You're not going to have to play bass. Uh, <laughs> and so you have to hang on. And that's easier said than done. But it's out there. And I believe in that. I'm a 
real believer in true love, and it's actually um, my Achilles heel, but um, you're gonna find love. And also, you're in a relationship, so <laughs> I actually think you've got a bigger problem here. <laughs> I think that maybe you are not with the right person and you're not going to find love until you stop being in this weird relationship that you don't even count. So start with breaking up with that person immediately and then um, don't go on any of the dating apps except Bumble, which was kind of fun. I was on Bumble for three hours. I didn't meet anyone. Uh, another sad letter. Sexless in Seattle, <laughs> which I thought was such a clever email title. I'm in such a bad place. I've only had sex once in the past five years. <sighs> and that was two years ago. Prior to that, I was in an emotionally abusive relationship for several years and it took a toll. I have zero self-esteem in romantic relationships and whenever I try to get out there, men keep ghosting me. Well, stop dating men. <laughs> as soon as I'm interested, I never hear from those fuckboys again. I've got that pretty privilege, so a lot of guys are DTF for the moment, but I get the feeling they don't actually like me. I want to get out there more, but I have a public profile, so dating online is tough because I can easily be found in a Google search of my profession plus my ethnicity. My self-esteem is at an all-time low. How do I stop feeling so ugly inside so that I can have the confidence to be intimate with someone? It's been two years, and honestly, I'm so ashamed. Oh, honey, um, there's nothing to be ashamed of in terms of dry spells. We all have them. And it's not about frequency. It's really about finding the right person to have sex with, whether it's for one night or for one week or one lifetime. And so you have to open yourself up to different kinds of opportunities and key is just stop dating men. <laughs> Heterosexuality is a choice. <laughs> I'm just, it's just the factual information. But if you insist on dating a man, <sighs> I don't even know what to say to straight people. It's so hard because Every time I talk to my straight friends, their stories are so tragic and so terrible, and their expectations for men are so low that I just want to say, just start over. Scorched earth, date women. Um, and then date women again. But, you know, you'll find a guy um, somehow, somewhere. But the first thing you have to do is recognize that you're hot and it's not because you're pretty and you have pretty privilege. You're hot because you're interesting and you're clearly smart. You have a great sense of humor and that's a good place to start. Sometimes when you can't like how you look and how you feel in your body, you have to like who you are and like how you think and how you see the world and you have to like whatever weird interest you have that you and like three other people have. Um, and then you sort of work outward from there. I started with, I love playing competitive Scrabble. And then I was just like, ooh, girl, really? But then I just <laughs> embraced it. I was like, you know what, I'm a nerd. I have a Scrabble board and I wear it like a backpack. <laughs> Date me. <laughs> and it totally worked. So. Like, find the weirdest thing about yourself and then go find some guy who also is into that weird thing. And if it's Scrabble, he probably will not break your heart. Um, and then go from, I mean, yes, Scrabble players are the best. Um, especially if they're women. <laughs> this is really bad advice. <laughs> but no, really, find something weird about yourself. Find someone who's weird to do it with you and start from there. And also, just like to get over the dry spell, I hear there's this app called Tinder, T-I-N-D-E-R. <laughs> and swipe right. <laughs> I think, <laughs> oh my God, I hope I did it right. I'm really bad at Tinder. Oh, a feminist question, yes. As a feminist, I was to embrace my independence and focus on growing as an individual. 
Although I'm also scared to try finding someone to share my journey with and risk sacrificing some small part of myself in the process. This sounds awful, but I'm afraid of being betrayed and being distracted by someone who might set me back. Do you have any words of advice or solace to share? <sighs> like everyone is just so worried about everything. And I get it, everything is terrible right now. But you know, when you say, you're worried of being distracted by someone who might set you back. Set you back from what? The reality is that love is part of life and you can't look at relationships as something that's going to set you back because if it is setting you back, it's the wrong relationship. Your relationships should propel you forward, whether it's romantic or with friends or with family. And so you wanna be looking for a partner who is only going to help you become the best feminist that you can be, which might be a bad feminist. I hear. <laughs> uh, I laugh at my own jokes, it's really embarrassing. But you really don't have to worry about someone holding you back because if you ever find someone that is holding you back, you can just break up with them. Uh, I hear the kids call it ghosting, which is what Charlize Theron did to Sean Penn. Just stop communicating with them. And eventually, hopefully, they'll get the hint. But. I think that when you are in the right romantic situation, you become a better person that you're meant to be. And that's certainly been my experience. Like with the right person, I don't have to compromise myself. I don't have to compromise my ambition, my intelligence, my weirdness, and the fact that I am extraordinarily lazy. I just get to be the laziest person I can be. Like truly, like, can you go get me some water? Thank you. That's my favorite question to ask. It's always like a little test. Like, is she gonna do it this time? I just asked her yesterday, and then she does. And I'm like, wow, I'm a king. <laughs> and so you're gonna find someone, and it's also gonna be scary, but it's supposed to be scary because you care. If you're not scared when you're in love, then you're not with the right person. Um, so good luck. I hope all of these people find love, I really do. I believe in it, I, like I said, pretty woman. And who among us hasn't waited for a billionaire to come and save us from ourselves? <laughs> and then we save him right back. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. <laughs> and so now everyone else is gonna come back on stage and we're gonna take questions from the audience about love, about life, about whatever. Yeah. Hi, Rachel. Hi. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you. Your pancreas is great. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's doing everything it needs to be doing. Oh, good. Which, as previously discussed, I probably don't know what those functions are. <laughs> this is not a medical show. No, it's um, not. But we could pretend to be doctors. I oh, have a, too many degrees, and so I'm always, always, always joking. I'm a doctor. And That's not a joke. to the people that are like closest to me, and they have become so resigned to it that now I'm like, let me examine you. They like lean in with this really resigned expression like. Oh. <sighs> and then I do my little exam and nothing happens, but it's fun for me. Uh -huh. Well, we're not resigned here. We're, no. We want, your, we want um, all of your medical expertise. Um, so we have Roxanne already with us, but I want to welcome everyone else back, so please, Welcome, um, Lindy West. <laughs> uh, Emily Gordon. And Guy Branham. <laughs> um, it's just really incredible to be in, on a stage with all of you. Uh, it was fun just like, to see all your names. Um, in a tweet, and now we've conjured it to real life. Um, so we're gonna talk for a minute, and then um, we will wanna hear from you too. But I just wanted to start, so Roxanne like, said it was trash advice. I think it was actually quite beautiful advice that I'm gonna like, carry with me. It was good advice, we just heard good advice. I wanna know like, what is the worst advice you've ever, I would say, received. We can blame anonymous other people or given. Just like, what is bad advice in love or life? that you've, the, the, worst, the worst thing you've ever advised someone to do? Uh, it was suggested to me uh, like two years ago, I think, 
around the holidays that I buy just a little bit of Bitcoin. So I have, so I have skin in the game while it's being discussed at holiday parties. It is a good conversation piece. There's at least that. And that's worth so much, don't you think? Uh, it is actually worth around 12% of what it was when I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> conversation was priceless, <laughs> wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. What do you get? Do they send you like a drawing of a coin? Like, <laughs> do you get like a certificate? What do you, Reg, I'm really asking. Like, um, what do you get when you buy it? I have libertarian street cred um, <laughs> that I'm probably not using enough. There are no traffic signs on that street. <laughs> <laughs> There's no government intervention That's very, at all. Yeah. That's solid riffing from dry, you guys. <laughs> but it's <a> dry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and have you, I refuse to believe you ever given bad advice. Have you ever received bad advice? Okay, I'm really, like, sometimes very bad on the fly, so this is the only thing that I can think of. Um, so get ready, it's very, uh, very stupid. Um, but one time, okay, so one time I had, like, a plugged up ear, and someone told me that if, <laughs> that if you pour hydrogen peroxide in your ear, it like dissolves your earwax and makes it like explode out of your head like uh, one of those volcanoes that you make, like a paper mache volcano. Um, it doesn't, <laughs> but I probably laid on the floor of my bathroom and poured a, um, like a shot glass of peroxide in my ear 30 times, <laughs> like just waiting for my ear to become um, useful again. And, um, and then I had to go to the otolaryngologist, and then he sucked it out with a tiny vacuum. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> um, to that doctor. It makes a fizzy noise. Mm. It feels like it's doing something. It right? feels like it's doing it's something, not. Emily. It's hurting and it's you. it's not. Because yeah. I had an ear infection and was told, get one of those ear candles. Just pop in. And I was like, sure. So I bought like a dozen ear candles and burned one dozen. Have you had an ear candle in your life? You lay on your side, you, it's a cone of, of waxy, and I think the idea is that osmosis will pull the wax from your ear into the candle, hmm. burning down, burning Science. down, occasionally yeah. burning you. I did that like six times, and then blood started running out of my ear. <laughs> <laughs> and I was working at the library, and I showed up at the library with blood, and I was like, I maybe need to go somewhere. <laughs> yeah. All you Look can quite. do is go have Dr. Yang suck it out with a tiny hose. It's um, I mean, I totally recommend it. It's incredible. Um, also, if you really want to be gross, you can watch videos of people doing it on the internet. So that's good advice. Yeah. What, bad advice in your life? Uh, the worst advice I've ever received was to try an edible. Mm. <laughs> and so I, I, w I was out to dinner with my friend Samantha Irby and a friend yes. of hers. <laughs> And her friend gave me this little cube of edibles, chocolate. Mm. And marijuana was still, see I'm old, marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> marijuana was still illegal. And so- Do you guys remember that? <laughs> I put it in a drawer because I knew the laws would change eventually. And- <laughs> You're thinking ahead. I really yeah. was. Yeah. Seven months later, marijuana became legal and I had some surgery last January and I ran out of pain medication and I was like, well, let me try this edible so I can mm. not focus on the pain. And I read the instructions on the back <laughs> and I took the recommended dosage. Wait, sorry, on the, the back of the... Of the on the okay. back of the it's chocolate. Official. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so it said to have three squares. Mm. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was really bad. And so... For the first 40 minutes, I was like, I don't feel anything at all. This isn't good. And then I felt everything. So I just <laughs> told myself, I need to get in bed immediately. And so I got in bed, and the room was spinning, and I was so scared, so I tied myself to the bed. <laughs> Wait, sorry. Um, was it a... Like a, a one-person operation, or? It was just me. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I was alone. That's like a... I Roxanne, was alone. do you have experience at that, though? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I was asking. I do. I, um... I want to be clear. Look, that's what I was 
asking. I was asking from like a Girl Scout perspective. I get a, like, well, what not did you use? It wasn't the Girl Scouts. Yeah. <laughs> not the way she's doing it. Where I learned <laughs> how to tie things, but... I oh. took the sheet, I took the flat sheet, and I lashed it. To, I have a canopy bed, a beautiful canopy bed from Room and Board. And so I tied one end of the sheet around it, and I tied the other end around my wrist so I could reach the bathroom. <laughs> but still really be tethered. Right. I really job. did, because I wanted to be tethered to the bed just in case the world fell. Yeah. Mm. Um, I ended up in the ER that night. Oh, no. Oh, no. And I was high for the next two days. <laughs> I've never had edibles since. So that was really bad advice. Oh, I'm man. a lightweight. Like, and when I was, and when the ambulance guys came to get me, they were so, they were like, ma'am, we need you to go unlock your door or we have to break it down. And so I was like, I'm gonna have to crawl. I'm tied to my bed. And he was like, cut yourself loose. And so I cut my sheets because I had some scissors in the nightstand. <laughs> and uh, I crawled to the front door and let them in, and they were like, what's going on? And I was like, well, it's legal now. <laughs> but I tried some edibles, and he was like, oh, well, we're getting a lot of this. <laughs> so yeah, I'm really cool. Did you get taken in, or did they just treat you there? No, they took me to the hospital. Holy shit! And I was there for 18 hours, and my wow. assistant drove me home. <laughs> She's here. <laughs> I'm really cool. Um, yeah, yeah, that was wow. bad, that was fully bad advice. It really yeah, was. it really, really was. Um, so don't try it. Yeah. Ro Roxanne, can I can I give you some advice for next time? Yes. Um, fewer squares of chocolate, more episodes of the nanny. Yes. Mm. Yes. Also, next time I'm not going to do it alone. Yeah. That's helpful. <laughs> that was yeah. the biggest mistake. I really don't know. I was not in my right mind. Mm. Like, where I was like, yeah, let me do this on my own. And it's been, like, getting more and more potent with each passing day. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> was, Emily, your candles was your... That, that didn't also sound like... That doesn't sound like great advice, but were there, was there another moment of... Well, I mean, I, I will say, as a, cause as a, since I was a therapist for many years, I have given a lot of bad advice. Mm. I think that is certainly... Because I think... Did you see people in your training when you're like, I've not done this before, but let me take a look? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's let what they just see about your problems. You, they throw you right in. Yeah. And I, my first internship, you kind of, they do a thing where they put you in a community counseling center and you're like, oh, I'll get the easy, like the, the patients that are like easy. No, they give you the ones that they are tired of dealing with. Mm. <laughs> And so you get like the kids that like I would literally leave I would have to like leave the room and I'd come back and they would have taken a shit in the corner and you're like cool uh, and then one I had one kid who kept he wouldn't talk to me directly but with, with, I had a I had to record my sessions for my supervisor and so I was like okay and he kind of liked talking to the tape recorder and I was mm -hmm. like oh well maybe this is the thing he won't talk to me and I was like you know what I'm gonna leave the room you mm -hmm. can say any of your deepest deepest thoughts, and he'd kind of been like, oh, I'm having thoughts about my mom, so I was like, okay, cool, talk to the tape recorder, not to me. Mm. And then <laughs> I left, and I came back, and I was like, should we play it? And he's like, no, not yet, but you know, like, I really poured my heart out, and I was like, okay, great. And then I listened to it, and of course, he's just like, fuck you, you stupid bitch! I hate you! You dumb bitch! I hate you so much! And you're like, yeah, I, yeah. I fully deserve that. I... <laughs> It is astounding the ways that, this was an eight-year-old, that an eight-year-old <laughs> will well, be able to take yeah. you, like, they are so much smarter than you in so many ways that you can't even imagine, <laughs> and they will trick you, and all you're trying to do is help. <laughs> it's amazing. They're some of the most honest human beings I've ever uh, run into, but I, I in my early years, I think you never stop making mistakes at that because every person is so unique, you're always going to mess up with them, but it is, uh, yeah, I've given a lot of bad advice. Oh, I'm so inspired now. <laughs> yeah. That's inspiring. Um, I think with that, like, with that, know that, like, um, we're all going to mess up, like, every time, no matter yeah. how hard we try, um, we should, like, open the floor up to questions for people to, um, see terrifying. what, see what, I mean, we've established, um, is there, like, a Comic-Con microphone a happening, or? Or? We're going to either, I'm going to, um, let us ruin your lives. <laughs> let us ruin your lives. Um, so, uh, I forgot to do this once and paid for it dearly. Um, I do want to say, it should be a question. Like, I'm sure you have, like, a lot of 
thoughts you might want to share. Um, it is fun to talk into a microphone. Let's make sure there's a pretty succinct query you want to put to someone on this stage. Um, and with that, I think we have microphones um, in the, uh, yes, on, uh, one on either Ooh, side. Oh, Comic Con style. Um, nice. And we're excited to hear whatever you want to hear. Let us be your still... Fraser. <laughs> Valentine's Day is coming up. I'm sure we're all concerned. Um, I actually. Maybe turn up the audio. Yeah, maybe we get a little house light. So we can shame you into it. <laughs> um, I, this was, the theme of love like wasn't, it was because it's February 12th was the day that we were able to do this and then it seemed only natural that we should talk about these general themes broadly construed, but you, you can ask about anything. Um, yes, hi. Hi. Hi, yeah, you're. Hello. Uh, this is so exciting to have four people whose Minds I admire all on the same stage. Um, that's not a question. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. No, no. Um, Sit down. Like succinct. <laughs> okay, that's it. Succinct uh, compliments are also fine. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so I didn't know that this was going to be part of it. So my question is probably going to be uh, fucked up. But um, I'm interested to hear uh, from you guys, especially you know in the area of love. Um, like, what do you think the future holds for fat people in those areas? Because I have recently uh, gotten really comfortable with the fact that I'm a fat woman. Uh, and uh, thank you. Um, and that I'm brave at the pool. Uh, so brave. Um, and, you know, in that comfort, there's still this, like, uh, unworthiness and like potential settling and I mean you know you know what I'm talking about like what the fuck when is this going to be done when am I going to not be wrong for being who I am and find somebody who can who's down with that that's it thanks I'm going to sit down now how dare you I really like that there are so many more fat people who are showing me ways that I could be seeing myself that I don't even think about. Like when I think about people like Nicole Byer doing, yes. you, know, um, yes. you know, Brave at the Pool photo shoots or EJ Johnson or people who take risks with their body and love their body in ways that I was sort of taught that I wasn't supposed to. It's like a really... I'm 43 years old, and there are ways that I'm very good at loving my body and loving other people's bodies. Um, <laughs> but I think, like, remembering that, like, as a grown-up adult, we can still grow up and still get over shit and remember... Uh, Lindy is one of my friends. In fact, I love Lindy West so much for so many reasons, um, but bitch is always throwing down with a level of fabulousness um, that, like, makes me excited for the rest of the day. That's so <laughs> um, uh, no, I don't, do not think that's an accurate, you're not around me most of the time, I'm very disgusting. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> I only see L.A. Lindy. <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood Lindy. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I mean, man. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm married and, like, it's really cool and I... I, and like for me, it was this weird thing where I, um, I sort of waited for like 27, 28 years and I was like, nothing can happen for me until I um, change my body. And then I kind of got mad about it and, um, and, and I was like, no, never mind. I'm not gonna, <laughs> like I, I can't just wait forever. Um, and I, and I, uh, and I, I mean, <laughs> I hate, this is horrible, this is not, I don't, I don't know, I don't know why this happened, but literally like the same week that I was like, I am not doing this anymore, then like my friend that I had been friends with for like 10 years was like, uh, we should, we should, then we were just, we got drunk and had sex, <laughs> and, um, and then now we're married, and, um, that's a meat cute, that is I a mean, meat yeah, cute. yeah, yeah. 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 
A good story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was like literally eight years ago. It sounds like you might not remember all the details, so it would be hard to like recreate in a narrative form, but um, um, we can fill it I in. remember <laughs> enough to be um, humiliated. Um, <laughs> but, um, that, you know, that's not real. Like, that's like just a coincidence, probably, but um, it, it's just, it still surprises me how uh, easy it is to slip into those old feel. Like, I still, like, often enough that it, it is irritating, um, like, I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> like, you know, like, I'm still, still, like, we're married. And, like, we never fight, and we're, like, best friends, and it's the best. And I'm still like, are you sure, though? <laughs> Did you, have you been paying attention? Like, are you... <laughs> I just want to check in and make sure that this is still cool with you. Like that, and um, it's, and I don't even really, and I don't even think, I still, I think that I have value and I think that I'm like pretty or whatever. Like I don't even think that I suck, but I still know what world that, what world I live in and I am like, um, are you really this like, are you sure? I don't know, and maybe that will never go away, but um, he is sure, and... Um, that sounds un maybe there, not ideal to live with all the time, but, um, but I, yeah, like comforting. I, I Life ain't ideal, yeah. Rachel. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. I, I do think, yeah. I think it's a little, I think it is, I think it's, we're never, that's the thing of like, oh, I wanna be done so I finally feel good about myself, is never gonna happen for anyone, yeah. I don't. I hope. Does anyone feel good about themselves all the time? Just like a quick, just like a quick round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> like, nice. I just like, I think that's such a more, yeah, none of us, it, you can have a day where you feel amazing and then the next day you're like, feel awful, but that, those two things get, can exist in the same person. Yeah, and, and like, totally. And literally, like, it couldn't be better and I'm still, it, it's, probably if I had a completely different body, I would still be like, you know, like, I'm very annoying. <laughs> like, are you sure? <laughs> so, you know. Um, so, uh, Rex, this was like a very, that was a great joke. I mean, a great moment. Sorry, not joke. It's the truth. It was the truth. No, no. just kidding. No, it's I'm not. sure, I, I feel like it it's should not be. The truth. Can you like, talk to us a little bit about You know, I think that's a really point. good yeah. question. And I've been in therapy for a while now. And thank God, because. <laughs> Hell yeah. You know, we're always waiting for this best version of ourselves, and if we achieve this best version of ourselves, then we're going to find the right one. And if we, you know, this nonsense, like, if you love yourself, someone else will love you, that's not true. Um, <laughs> I'm full of self-loathing, oh, no. and I have no problem finding, well, I have lots of problems, but I've found love anyway. <laughs> um, and so I think part of it is just accepting that we live in a world that is very cruel to fat bodies and that is wildly inhospitable to fat bodies. And so it's understandable that we take some of that on even when we know we shouldn't. And so it's important to find ways to love yourself regardless and to recognize that your body is perfect exactly as it is regardless of what people say. And this notion that you're not gonna find love and that you're unlovable, trust me, there is no size at which someone won't love you. And um, that, is, that is just the truth. And this is kind of a joke, but it's also the truth. I watched my 600 pound life on TLC and nearly every one of those motherfuckers is in a relationship. <laughs> I have been singler than Jesus. And I have watched that show and have been like, huh. <laughs> well, Brian is doing okay. <laughs> And, and I truly don't mean that in a mean way. I truly mean that people, you, we love who we love. Like, there not a day goes by when my girlfriend doesn't tell me, you don't need to lose another pound. Like, I love you exactly as you are. I would love you 100 pounds heavier, and I would love you 100 pounds lighter. And unfortunately, I need that external validation every day. Huh. Like, You're Lindy, I'm like, are you sure? Like, world? Yeah. you don't want to, like, get a receipt or something? <laughs> um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like a real reaction. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it's okay to be insecure. It's okay to have these worries, but it's also okay to allow yourself to trust that someone's going to love you and your beautiful body. Okay. Wonderful. Good time to hear from a couple of people. Hi. Hi. 
I concern my question is not very interesting, but the line was short when I got here, so I hope it's okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's great. it has to be a question, no self-deprecating. <laughs> it's going to be a wonderful question. Yes. yes. Um, I'm thrilled to be in the presence of all this brain power in the same room, and I'm unfamiliar with your work and your work, but I will be seeing your movie and buying your book. I was like, we don't know who you're pointing at, so it could be. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> don't have to tell me. You guys we know she right. means my book. <laughs> Actually, that brings me to how much I love Lindy and Guy. Um, truly. Um, I was about 11 when at a, at a middle school assembly, the high school came to perform a piece, of, a bit of The Sound of Music. And the actress, who was in high school, probably, if I were guessing, weighed about 450 pounds. And she sang Climb Every Mountain. She was one of the nuns. And we get a lot of nonsense about bodies, fat bodies, and sex and love. But I have managed to superimpose all kinds of other nonsense. Like, wait a minute, how can she sing so beautifully and be fat? And there are a couple of things, well, there are so many things I could be here all night, but Guy, when you said, on a dance floor, I am like a pig in deep swill. <laughs> um, what is it? Ecstatic beyond all rationality and doing exactly what God put me on earth to do. <laughs> I am a dancer. I was made that way. There's nothing I can do about it. And I have been ashamed all of my life of trying to dance. And Lindy, when you said, it's at this point that I knew men wanted to have sex with me, they just hated themselves for it. There is something about what you have both preached, which is that we have been taught that in fat bodies we are not allowed to enjoy them. And I'm a half century old, still unpacking this shit, and you have opened my world. So my question, which is not very interesting, is are you going to be signing books? <laughs> and, nice and, that was well done, that was very well, well done. Can I please kiss each of you on the cheek and hug you too hard and get my friend to take a picture of us when I do. Jesus um, Christ. I, I was going to sign books, but I am dead now, so... <laughs> Sorry. And there's no wrong answer. You owe me nothing. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we're signing books. <laughs> yes, of course, absolutely. You, you I'm couldn't glad stop I me from hugging you. That was incredible. I mean, I, I, I already... I can't talk. I, I told you I died. Well, bless you, you all, because the work you do is <laughs> represents considerable sacrifice. You chose something hard, and you chose to be naked and revealed in what you did. And to do jobs when you were young that didn't pay much, and have people tell you you were dumb, and you have blessed a whole generation. Wow. Thank and you people so much. who are somebody's thank mommy. You. I have teenagers. You have made a world of difference, and thank you very much. And I wish I'd brought a more interesting question. <laughs> you did all right. Thank you. You're really an lovely. angel, and we'll see you after. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Um, I, I do think we have time to hear from one more person. It, you don't have to have um, you don't have to like extemporaneously quote from the work for people. Like that was um, that was quite remarkable. But um, you know if. if there's something on your mind um, that, There's that someone there. we can address. Oh, sorry. I'm. Oh, hi. hi. Yes. The microphone is yours. Um, so I almost didn't get up and ask this question because I didn't want to displace the smaller people in the row to squeeze through and do it. But fuck you guys. I have to get back to this. <laughs> 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 All right. I think I think that's a beautiful question. Just <laughs> from the beginning. Um, this fall, I went to, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I went to London and I watched too much theater and my paranoia about being in London theater seats was so extreme, I was so hyper-managing it, and then I finally got a lady at fucking Anthony and Cleopatra who was, like, pissy about me being next to her, and, like, I think we should just consider not giving a shit more. <laughs> I'm so sorry for steamrolling you, no, no, no. but, yeah. So... So, um, you know, I'm battling, well, I'm not battling. I'm, I'm battling myself trying to accept, you know, I'm, I'm brown, I'm feminist, I'm queer, LGBT, you know, all these things. And I've been battling myself to accept these things about myself 
and then now that I'm getting to a great place, you know, I, I'm walking with my masters in May. I'm like ready to share. With you. <clears throat> I'm ready to start sharing myself with the world and actually contributing my gifts to the world. And especially in these these times right now, with Trump as president, you know, I, there's a lot of aggression. So. My question is, how do you guys deal with the aggression, whether it's microaggression, and right now there's a lot of overt aggression, mm -hmm. but how do you deal with that when you're sharing yourselves and your gifts with the world? Can I? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, Roxanne, I wondered if you could take that first, just because I've long marveled. Um, I don't know if you guys follow Roxanne on Twitter. You should. <laughs> um, it's, yeah. <clears throat> It's a, it's a remarkable masterclass in how to deal with some of the themes um, the questioner brought up. And yeah, that's a really good question. <coughs> Sorry, I'm actually a shy person in my real life. And I've been on the internet since 1992. And hmm. on the internet, I was always able to be a much braver and more interesting version of myself because no one could see me. And so I could be something beyond my body in a world that did not care about my body or wanted to be cruel to it. And when my career started taking off and I became much more visible in the world, people certainly brought a lot of their bullshit to my doorstep virtually and also in person. And I was bullied a lot as a child because I was really, I was a runt as a kid. I was really undersized and nerdy and weird. And I hated it, and I never had the wherewithal, the courage to push back. And I'm big now in every sense of the word. And so when trolls come to my doorstep and when people try to take the vulnerabilities that I choose to put out into the world in service of my work, um, when they choose to exploit them, I'm not gonna just sit there and be okay with it. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna be aggressive toward me, I'm sorry, but I'm more Malcolm X than Martin Luther King. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to push back. And I even say it in my bio on Twitter. If you clap, I will clap back. Mm -hmm. And people, people still clap. They people still clap, clap and yeah. they seem to not understand the words that I say in plain English. And it's really interesting. And then they say, oh, I was just trying to debate you, especially <sighs> men, white men, white heterosexual men. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that, but <laughs> I find that what oftentimes, and it trickles down from the administration to these people who are newly emboldened. Um, they really think that if they're aggressive, we're gonna cower. And so I am finding with each increasing year, and part of it does come with success, but a lot of it just comes with maturity and just being more comfortable with who I am. I have every right to push back. And it feels really good to do so, to say, you know what, I am not what you think I am. And you don't get to demean me simply because you're feeling really badly about yourself. Um, and it's really refreshing. And so I push back. And I push back hard because I'm not just pushing back for myself. I'm pushing back for people who don't have my visibility and who don't have my platform and who don't have the personal resources. And by that, I mean a support system, friends and family and a partner that I have that make it possible for me to do this kind of work in the public eye. Um, and it feels really good. And it's fun, it's fun to read also. So just, if you want to like take a dip in, it's a, it's a master class in clapping back. It's People often remarkable. say like, aren't you above this? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no one's above it. Um, Emily, when you made, like your life, it, so that's a vulnerability to share, like a version of your story. Yeah. Did you did you hear from people oh, or what was? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I I think you have to, and you, it's a line that keeps moving. But I think well, you kept saying share your gifts with the world, which I think is a wonderful way to put it. And you ha I at some point I had to decide what gifts I was willing to share and what gifts I wasn't. And I think having that boundary, I'm a big fan of boundaries, and having that boundary clear within myself of like. Even if you're criticizing how I fell in love with my husband because I put that out there, you're still not getting to the core of who I am as a person. Maybe I'm just telling myself that. Who cares? But either way, there's a, there needs to be, when you are sharing, when you're being vulnerable with people, I think there, 
you kind of at some point develop a level of self-protection of like, I'm not willing to let this part of me go. You can get at all this other stuff, but you're not gonna get to this part of me, because this is me, and you're not ever gonna even know this part of me. So fuck off, you can say whatever you want about the thing I put out there. Uh, and that has helped me tremendously, because I think otherwise you just, no one is dismantling your person with any of the things that they're doing. They can't, your personhood is too strong for that. And, mm -hmm. and keep that in mind. And whatever you need to do, whatever you need to, like if you need to do a salt circle around yourself, whatever it is, but mm -hmm. keep that version of yourself like strong because uh, they'll come for everything else. It's part of how it is now. It's very good advice. Don't do the edibles, but do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think we have one more question over there. Hi, thanks. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, I was gonna go to this microphone for one last question, right? Hi, yes, sorry. Um, different kind of love, like friend, friend love. I have some girlfriends who I think about them and I feel that they're my best friends. We're separated sometimes by distance or folks are very into their partners or they have kids and responsibilities. Um, how do you maintain or what advice would you give for maintaining really strong friendships? Oof, that's such a good question. Um, I, my, my best friend, uh, and I have a few friends in the audience tonight, I think, too, uh, but my best friend, uh, who is back in North Carolina, she and I were uh, very, very, very close to each other, and it's been such an interesting thing as we both have gotten partners and both separated from our partners and then got new partners, like, to watch our relationship kind of evolve, and I think we at first thought it meant that there was something wrong with us, and what is true is that she used to be my main form of like social life. What am I doing this weekend? What, what's happening? Who do I go to when I'm crying? And now I realize that I just have more people to rely on for that. And I think at first we both felt threatened by that. And we had to like kind of acknowledge it before we could move on to like, oh, it's okay. It's not, I'm not your only person, but that's cool because frankly, we're both a bit much. We could use the help. <laughs> <laughs> so like now we have help with getting ourselves through life but it hurt, and, and we just had to acknowledge that it hurt. I think that was a big, we kind of tiptoed around it when I, I moved uh, away, and then we just had this like knockdown, drag out, like crying fight, and then we were like, oh, okay, this is gonna be just a little different now. So we do dumb little things like, we'll text each other what we're eating, if we're eating something particularly gross, or if we're doing something particularly weird, we'll just like take a photo, and, and that weirdly helps me feel connected to her. I see her maybe twice or three times a year, but, uh, and I like, have started texting with her six-year-old daughter. That helps. Uh, <laughs> she only does emojis. But uh, that weird little stuff, like whenever I eat this, like a jalapeno popper, you're going to know about it every single time. Mm. And it's weirdly like that helps us kind of stay connected. But just acknowledging like it is going to change. It can't, it can't stay the same. The only thing constant is change. That's it. So you have to like lean into that and not pretend like it's old times every single time. That's what I would say. Same answer. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, have the same, yeah. I have like the same group of best friends since um, like a freakish age, like third grade. Um, but it's the same. It's like we are all um, all over the place now and, and busy. And um, I mean, this is such a boring answer. We just have to put stuff on the calendar. Like, you know, <laughs> like it's just like, we just have like things booked out like once a month. We're gonna, you know, do get do something. This is jalapeno poppers. Yeah, we're gonna do a jalapeno popper yeah. because otherwise it is like your whole life just gets away from you and you know, like the, the, there there was like this these dark years where I didn't see any of my friends for like three years and then I realized that like they didn't like me anymore and then I had to rebuild the friendships from scratch, but it worked. Google Calendar. Google Calendar. Yeah. All right, I have two pieces of advice. The first one is, become a touring comedian. Um, <laughs> if you randomly end up in Bloomington, Indiana, once every two years, you're gonna see Dr. Jen Brass on a regular basis. Uh, and we go to the farmer's market with her son, Harv. It's very fun. Um, the second is, I can get into a space of like, I am not good good enough friends to reach out at a time when I need to. I'm very terrible at being friends with people. Yes. Um, but just sort of, like there was a situation within the past year when I was just like, who do I talk to about this? And I was like, Lindy West is the perfect person to talk to about this guy. 
fucking call Lindy West. And it had been six months since we had talked to each other, and Lindy was just like, I am here for it. Um, so I would say be friends with uh, emotionally broken people who are perfectly fine with not talking to you for six months, <laughs> and then can give you well, full intimacy in the moment you need it. That's sort of this. Yeah, that's good. That's sort of the same advice of becoming a comedian, though. <laughs> like, be friends with emotionally broken people. True. It's a twofer. Um, Roxanne, final thoughts on friendship. Um, I agree with what everyone here said. You know, because I, I'm on the road uh, too much, like, I don't know, 30 weeks out of the year, I'm really a terrible friend. But I'm also a good friend because whenever you need me for whatever reason, if you need me to beat someone up, I've never beat anyone up, but virtually. <laughs> like in my soul, I'm kicking their ass. Um, but I do add them to my nemesis roster. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Your That's nemesis nice you. is my nemesis. That's very kind of I've you. got fucking room in that. <laughs> I really do. The Rolodex and so, is not full. I, it's not. It will never be full. Not for pettiness. Mm -mm. So I just try to be like the best friend I can be mm. in the ways that I can and, you know, like make time. So like one of my best friends is here tonight, Renda, and mm. we always make the effort and God bless her. She is the fuel and the wind beneath my wings because no matter what, she's always checking in. Hey, boo, you in town today? And there's no pressure if I can't Ooh, or nice. if I have to cancel something. She's like, I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm. And like to have friends that you can do that with where you stay in touch regularly, you text regularly, but it's okay if you don't see each other for because life gets in both of your way. Mm -hmm. um, those are the friendships I cultivate the most. And then of course, with my best friend, we just put in the work. Um, we talk every day and yeah. um, she's the sun and the moon. Like without that, I don't know what I would do. And so I make sure that I put in that time because I don't want my earth to go off its axis. And it's mm -hmm. also important to have someone like that. It's a very good lesson that you find someone who has like a lot of room for nemeses. Um, it's and so good. The pure pleasure of being able to cancel on someone. Um, but and you can cancel on me too. I will be fine. Oh, oh. And well, frankly, a little well, relief. It's so great. <laughs> I want to. Well, can I say one more thing? Uh -huh. Also, be pushy. That one over there, she got herself Academy Award nomination. She was going to like like uh, Where is award this shows all the time. <laughs> yeah. No, it was just that like, I, I sent you effusive email that was like, you make me feel like I am getting to be on that red carpet. <laughs> and part of me was like, don't send that to her. She's very fancy and you don't need to be involving when yourself in her life. have ever been fancy? And I was like, You're no, fancy. that's you putting yourself in Emily Gordon's real life, reminding her that you guys are friends. Also, I saw you at the Vanity Fair Oscar party and you were standing one foot from P. Diddy. So, <laughs> when have you ever been fancy? But also, <laughs> you were there too, baby. As a journalist, <laughs> not so, as a star. I think where we've landed tonight is we're all sort of one foot away from P. Diddy. And, <laughs> and that's the energy I want to carry forward <laughs> to Valentine's Day and beyond. Um, <laughs> we... <laughs> I feel like P. Diddy, like, he's going to counteract the Kathy. Something won't work out. Um, we're so thrilled that you joined us for the first ever NYT Live, um, Op-Ed Live here in LA. We hope to do it again. Um, again, we were joined by Emily Gordon, Roxanne Gay, Lindy West, Guy Branham. Can we get um, Rachel Dry as well? Rachel, Rachel, Rachel Dry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as that like, beautifully articulate questioner pointed out, uh, there will be books to be signed in the lobby, so um, we'll be there to, to meet you if that's something you like to do, and if not, have a wonderful rest of your night, and thank you so much for joining us. Bye. <laughs>